Welcome to X Corner. I'm here adding a little mutation to the superhero crew. I'll be covering the X comics for the week of May 22nd, 2019. This week we have four comics. Age of X-Men, The Amazing Nightcrawler number 4, Mr. and Mrs. X number 11, War of the Realms, Uncanny X-Men number 2, and X-Force number 8. Spoilers, of course. We'll start with Age of X-Men, The Amazing Nightcrawler number 4, written by Shannon McGuire and art by Juan Fergari. We begin with Nightcrawler and his crew fighting Mastermind and hers at a mall. The public thinks it's a publicity stunt. As Nightcrawler's team wins, he convinces Mastermind and her people to leave peaceably. He does see the girl he's looking for in the crowd, but Mystique is there, and she disappears with her. One of the cuckoos helps Nightcrawler locate the girl, and they teleport to her. They find Megan and the girl watching TV. Megan shifts to Mystique after Nightcrawler asks her what happened. Mystique is spouting nonsense, and Nightcrawler demands to know where Megan is. But then the cuckoo speaks up, saying Mystique is Megan. She is psychically changing into what Nightcrawler wants, even subconsciously. The cuckoo explains that her and her sisters have been erasing their memories every time they fall in love and go looking for the child. This has caused Megan to lose it, it seems. The cuckoos just want their sisters to be together, and will do what it takes to ensure that. But now it seems the mind wipes won't be enough, and she brings her two other sisters and a mind-controlled bunch of mutants to deal with Megan and Kurt permanently. This was a bit of a mind death. They dropped hints early on in the issue, and probably earlier in the series, where Kurt wasn't remembering things right. Then they make it seem like Department X got a hold of him at some point, to mess him up. But then the big twist, that it was the Cuckoos. Go to reels as they went, if it was a bit wordy at times. This isn't just a book you can skim. Now I guess we'll get a big fight. Probably a bit anticlimactic, but we'll see. 8 out of 10. Then we have Mr. and Mrs. X number 11, written by Kelly Thompson, art by Oscar Bazaldois. Gambit is heading to New Orleans to deal with the unrest in the Thieves Guild he is the absent king of. He sneaks through the airport in disguise and makes his way to the guild. They are arguing what to do with him, so he makes a grand entrance to get everyone in line. It doesn't work though, as they immediately attack him. He beats the thieves back, only to find the person in charge now is a resurrected Kandra, one of the externals. She's bringing the guilds back together, and we find that the Assassin's Guild is there too, led by Gambit's ex-wife, Belladonna. Belladonna blasts Gambit, showing which side she's on. He wakes up in chains, but hears a commotion outside. Rogue has come to save him. She decimates both guilds and makes it to him, but is blasted from behind by Kandra and Belladonna. She wakes up strung up next to Gambit again. They are shocked unconscious, and Gambit wakes up to Rogue about to be sacrificed by Kandra. This is a pretty issue with great Basil Dwar art, as usual, but it did feel a bit repetitive to what always happens to these two. They get in trouble, fight, get captured, get strung up, escape somehow. They even quip that they keep waking up in chains. I did like the beginning, where we get to see where these two fit into the post-Age of X-Men world. Gambit knows they'll eventually go to join back up with the X-Men once they get through this adventure. With the inevitable reboot happening, they probably won't get the chance though. This was a fine issue, but too derivative to be anything more than a 6 out of 10. Next we have War of the Realms and Kenny X-Men number 2, written by Matthew Rosenberg, art by Perry Perez. We find ourselves in the Asgardified New York, with Danny rescuing survivors being chased by frost giants. She gets overwhelmed when an army of dupes shows up to help. They lead the survivors to the base where Havoc clears a bunch of the giants out. The last one is taken down by a sniper cyclops who uses a scope to shoot his eye beam like a laser. The survivors make it to the base, which is abandoned baseball field. Meanwhile, back with Hope and her group, we see them dealing with frost giants also. Hope bazookas one, but gets ripped in half for her efforts. Luckily, we find out she's a duplicated Jamie's multiple man powers, so it's just a dupe who died. They are then jumped by Sabretooth, leading a pack of health hounds. Sabretooth and Wolvesbane have an epic fight, but it's interrupted when Havoc and the other X-Men show up to help. We find out Wolvesbane has been taken by Sabretooth, though. And they also have magic, too. And they want to use their powers to teleport the invading Dark Elf army around so that they can win. Sabretooth plans to use Wolvesbane to persuade her to help them. He is interrupted, though, by Ymir, who is Wolvesbane's long-lost and recently dead ex-boyfriend, who says he escaped Hela to come for her. And he brought their also recently dead child with him. This miniseries is fun, even if I'm not reading the main War of the Realms title. All you need to know is that Asgard has come to Earth. It's also acting as a send-off for Wolvesbane, who we know has died since this in the regular book. Hopefully she finds peace with her family in the afterlife. 
might lessen the impact of her murder a bit by almost giving her a reason to want to die, but we'll see how they deal with this in the final issue. Also fun part was when Hope had a dupe die, someone asked how she could be so callous and uncaring, and that Jamie is upset when his dupes die, and she pretty much says that he's a pussy, and it hurts, but it, just to suck it up. This miniseries is pretty damn fun. It really helps that it's in continuity with the Uncanny run, and it's written by the same writer. I wouldn't even mind if this was part of the Uncanny book since they fit so well. Only one more issue, but so far so good. 8 out of 10. Lastly, we have X-Force number 8, written by Ed Brisson, art by Dylan Burnett. X-Force has traveled 2,000 years into the future to find Kid Cable, but now they don't know where to look. Luckily, they show up right when Rachel is making her psychic announcement for all her followers to meet her, so they get that lead at least. Meanwhile, Kid Cable is nearly enveloped by his techno-organic virus. Back with the Ascani tribe, Domino is making friends her own way as she convinces Blacksmith that they aren't working for Strife. Of course, she doesn't know that his forces are about to attack. The MLA do attack, and X-Force is forced to try and protect the Ascani. In the middle of the fight, some of the MLA seem to come out of their mind control. Back with Strife, it seems his psychics are having issues controlling both the MLA and Rachel. Strife has them release Rachel, and the MLA resume their attack. Back with Kid Cable, his techno-organic virus has run rampant, and now his girlfriend is encased in it too. Back with the Ascani, the bad guys are about to kill Blacksmith, and if that happens, he'll never send the original Cable back in time, and that would be very bad for the time stream. No forgiving MCU time travel here. This was an action-packed book, with all the pieces falling into place for the epic end battle. Letting Rachel go psychically is going to bite Strife in the ass so bad. The art here, while mostly fun, crazy style I raved about last issue, seems to generally get extremely indie, especially when showing Cable's girlfriend. Her eyes are like dolly paintings. And the same thing happens when Rachel's in the sky. Strange deviation that I never noticed before, so I wonder if it's the artist's was a bit time rushed for this issue. In any case, still fun, and it gets a 7 out of 10. That's it for another week. There was a Marvel Comics Presents issue too, but it seems to be delayed, so I'll save it for next week. The wrapping up of this X-Men era is fast approaching and can feel it with all these issues. It's where you get every comic and a run at the same time, so it definitely feels like a fast approaching brick wall. Only time will tell if we'll break through to the other side. Till next week.